Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. What are we going to do with this guy? Okay, appreciate that. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and grab that? We're in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible, uh, you can follow along on the Bible app with our sermon notes. You'll also find a Bible somewhere around you. Um, you can pick that up. I think it's on page 589 is 1 Peter 2. If you don't have a Bible, if you don't like your Bible, if you like our Bible better, that is our gift to you. Please take that home uh, as we continue on on this series in 1 Peter. So have you ever... Um, gotten a phone call that you didn't want to answer? If I called you today, don't laugh at that. Have you ever gotten a phone call that you didn't want to answer? I got a phone call earlier this week that I did not want to answer. Uh, I came across caller ID is a beautiful thing. You know whether or not, you know it's coming. And, and I saw that on the caller ID, it was a friend of ours uh, named Michael. And so Michael, uh, I answer the phone and, and say hello. And uh, he says, hey, how's it going? And so I immediately, I know what this conversation's about. So I immediately divert the way it's going, okay? So I start saying, um, you know, tell me about your fourth plans. It was he and his wife's uh, anniversary that day, or the day before. I said, what did you do for your anniversary? Tell me all about that. Just anything I could do to get away from what was coming. Didn't want to answer the phone call, did, diverted. And then after uh, a, a few minutes of small talk, sen senseless small talk, uh, he says, well, I got the MRI results. Do you want to know? So let me back up a little bit. Uh, a lot of you know that uh, I, I am, was, how, whatever the verb is, uh, a big runner. Uh, for, I'm one of those people that just runs for no reason. I enjoy doing it. It's, it's cleansing. It's good for my spirit and my soul and my body. And so about uh, six, seven weeks ago, I was out for a pretty basic run. Um, I, I was in the habit of running about 25, 30 miles a week. I was doing um, just a, a basic early uh, Wednesday morning, about six o'clock in the morning as the sun was rising run. I was about a mile and a half into a pretty average run, regular pace, nothing crazy. I, I'm in the middle of Pebble Creek, and, and I am going in a straight line, and I hear and feel a pop in my right knee. So I knew something was wrong, I, and I kind of I kind of tried to walk it off, do the guy thing, you know, rub some dirt on it, kind of shake it around a little bit, that'll be fine. Uh, tried to pick up running again, very quickly realized that I was in no shape to run. So um, I'm left with a decision now. Do I limp home uh, for a mile and a half, or do I call and wake my wife? I chose the latter. I called Alex. I said, uh, Alex, and she said as soon as she saw the phone, uh, probably an a, a call she didn't want to answer. She sees my name on there. She said immediately I knew. So uh, she gets loads up in the car, comes and picks me up, pitiful me, comes back, gets me home. So uh, I realized then that there was something wrong with my knee. So I did what um, any red-blooded American male would do. Um, I waited six weeks. Um, I thought it would get better. I took some Advil. I did the whole ice thing. I, I didn't go fully 100% in our church league softball games. Um, but finally, uh, after a few more tweaks and a lot more pain and a lot of swelling, I realized uh, it was time to get this looked at. So fast forward to this week. He said, so do you want to know your results? And I said, no, but why don't you go and tell me? Tell me. And he uh uh, Dr. Connolly said, uh, it's a medial meniscus tear. He said, it's a pretty bad one. Um, so he said, you know, you're going to have to go under the knife. And so th in the stages of grief, I think the first one's bargaining. So I began bargaining with him. And I said, yeah, I, had talk I talked to a physical therapist at Lakeway last week. Um, she said that uh, a lot of the times now they're not doing that sort of surgery, that they're just doing really good therapy. Like, I'm willing to do that. Can I just do that? He said, well, you could. Um, but somebody your age, and he said, he said, if, if you want to get back to where you were, if you want to get to where what you're capable of doing, you're going to have to go under the knife, and then you're going to have to go to physical therapy. And so that's when I realized uh, that I would have to go under the knife and get physical therapy after that to fix this knee of mine. Now, why do I tell you that? I tell you that because this week we're going to be looking at a passage in First Peter chapter two. That up until this point, Peter has been very encouraging. Uh, we've talked about the living hope that Christ gives us. We've talked about how we're all exiles and we're wandering around, but we have a hope in Christ Jesus. And now he says, I'm going to keep encouraging you, but it's time for us to go under the knife. He says, look, if you want to be all that God has called you to be as the people of God that he has created you to be, sometimes it requires some spiritual surgery. And that's what leads us into 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'll read verses 4 through 8. Peter writes this. As you come to him, 
a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For as it stands in Scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So Peter starts out this bit on spiritual surgery by saying this, as you come to him, as you approach the throne of God, as you bring your cares, your wants, your desires to him. This very short phrase would have flown in the face of many of the religious people at the time, and I think many religious people today. That this is an entire paradigm shift in how they think about God. Many people at the time thought about God as somebody so unapproachable, so out there, so holy and perfect and big, that little old me, little old us, could never approach him. It's the same kind of people thinking that people even have today. They think, I'm so small, I'm so dirty, why would God care about something so small like me. It's a, it's a phenomenon that now as a pastor I experience quite often. They think that only some people can approach the throne of God, right? Because any time I'm at a meal, guess who's asked to say grace? That, that reverend in front of my name, somehow, somehow people think that three years of seminary they taught us like how to hardwire a line directly to God that no one else has. I, I, I see this all the time, and, and I, I love that on your cards there, and if you're a guest, please fill that out, drop it in the bucket at the end, forgot to say that earlier. But I love how you put your prayer requests on there. And, and I read over those each week, I pray over those each week, but some people treat that as, as the only prayer. They think, oh, because this guy can get up and, stop and talk about the Bible, then, then his prayers must mean more. He must understand more. But, but this you here in the text, in the Greek, is actually plural. The best translation of it is y'all. He's saying as y'all, it's amazing how Texans can actually fix the English language because there's no plural you. Anyway, he's saying as y'all come to God, as you all approach him, this is how you should approach him. Just having a reverend in front of my name doesn't mean that I have a direct line to God. It doesn't mean that my prayers are any better or more important than any of yours. We can all approach the throne of God with the exact same confidence. And what is that confidence? The confidence is that we, just like Jesus, were rejected but were also chosen. That we, like Jesus, maybe are overlooked sometimes. Not what people were expecting, but in the sight of God, we are precious, we are chosen. Because Jesus was not the Messiah that people wanted him to be. The Jewish people were expecting somebody to ride in on a white horse and to overthrow the government. They were expecting somebody rich, somebody powerful. Instead, they got a poor, homeless peasant who, who would travel the countryside teaching, hanging out with sick people and sinners. He, he was rejected because he wasn't what they wanted. What they wanted was a Messiah to come in and to fix all of their, their physical problems. They said, we see an oppressive government. We see um, wealth that we want. We see power that we want. And so they want a Messiah to restore their wealth and their power. But Jesus came and he didn't do any of that. He, he didn't come to secure their situation. Jesus came to secure their salvation. Jesus doesn't come into your life just so that he can fix your situation, your physical needs. You may have physical needs, and God cares deeply about those. But the purpose of Christ Jesus is not to immediately remedy those. Your, your financial problems, your relationship problems, your health problems, his main goal is not do that. His main goal is to restore your soul. It's not about your situation. It's about your salvation. And we have the confidence that just as Jesus was rejected and chosen, we too, even though we may be rejected, are chosen as well. But, but these physical needs, we, we still have them, right? We, we still have problems in our, in our family, in our homes, in our, in our finances. And so we have these physical needs, and so many people cry out and give up on God because they say, look, you have not met my physical needs. I've got this problem in my life. Maybe you've got a problem in your life. 
And maybe you've been waiting for God to intervene, for God to come in to make peace where there is no peace, to make healing where there is hurt. But friends, my fear is that many of us are not taking that step of approaching the throne of God. Jesus isn't going to answer prayers that you don't pray. Unless you ask him, you're, you're not going to get an answer. But many of us walk along just waiting for something magically to happen when we've never asked God in the first place for that need. It's an unmet expectation that God doesn't know that we have of him. It makes me think a lot of when I do premarital counseling. We'll do it soon. In premarital counseling, I, I, have, I have the couple, I have them write down expectations of the other spouse. So, so we talk about things like, who's going who's gonna to do uh, the chores? Is anybody going to stay home with the kids? Are there going to be kids? Who's going to be in control of the finances? And I say, don't talk about it with your spouse, but make all of your expectations for them, and they're going to make all of their expectations for you, and then we're going to compare. It's a lot of fun. Because what we discover when we do that is that so many marriages are, are dwindling away because there's unmet expectations that were never voiced as expectations. People expect their, their wives expect their husbands to act exactly like their fathers. And, and husbands expect wives to act exactly like their mothers. And so when there's not a hot, fresh meal at 6.30 every afternoon, or the lawn isn't mowed perfectly every week, then there's conflict. Because the other person didn't know that that was an expectation, there's conflict. The same is true of God. God knows your expectations, but he's not going to guess them unless you voice them to him. Unless you approach the throne of God boldly and say, God, this is something messed up in my life. This is where I need spiritual surgery. Please come in and help me fix this problem. God may or may not ever answer. But the best way to do it is to approach him, to tell him, to pray the prayers and then expect there to be answers. We can approach boldly. We were rejected like Jesus, but we can still approach boldly. And it just requires being asked. Jesus was rejected, but as the scripture said, he was chosen and he was precious. That's the hope that Peter weaves into here, is that we, like Jesus, maybe we may be rejected, we may be looked down upon, but we are chosen and we are precious. Someone, that, that's all you need to hear tonight, is that in the eyes of God, you are chosen and you are precious. Despite what people say, despite what you say about yourself, you are chosen and you are precious. So um, I'm not much of an art guy. Do we have any art people? Nobody appreciates art? Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sally does. One. Okay. So I'm not an art guy. Uh, I, at a church I served out in North Carolina, we had a couple of art professors, modern art professors. I don't understand modern art even more than that. They bring me over to their house. They show me lovely people. They show me uh, their, their studio, and they tell me about what modern art is. And I was like, that's a nice piece. And they're like, that's our child's finger painting. I'm like, I can't tell the difference. Please explain. Uh, I'm not an art guy, but I can appreciate um, really famous, really great works of art. So I've never seen it, but I hope to maybe see it one day. Um, the Statue of David by Michelangelo. Many of you have seen the pictures uh, of the statue. I, I was, have we seen the Aubergs, if y'all seen the actual statue? I was going to show a picture up here. It's a little too PG-13 for us. Um, but <laughs> just saying, <laughs> there's young eyes. Um, but so it, it's, it's 16, 17 feet in the air, right? This marble, beautiful work of art. Uh, that people say, I, people can just stare at it for hours and just be awestruck at, at this wonderful, wonderful sculpture of the biblical character, David. But what many people don't know is that there's quite a story behind that sculpture. That, that for a long time, that, that block of marble sat. It, it was commissioned to be a, a statue long before Michelangelo came upon it. And, and for different reasons, a couple of artists started on this work, started on this chunk, and, and just gave up. And so they say that the legs were cut out, but, but this block of marble, this very expensive marble, sat in, in essentially a junkyard for 26 years. It was outdoor, it was exposed to the rain, to the wind, and it just sat. Until Michelangelo came upon it and he said, I, I think there's something in there. He said, even though others have rejected this stone, even though people have overlooked this, have tried, I see something else. He said this, he said, I saw the angel in that marble, and I carved it until I set him free. 
I saw the angel in that slab of marble, and I carved him until I set him free. God sees in you a big old chunk of marble. You may be battered by the wind, you may be battered by the rain, you may feel neglected for 26 years, but God, like Michelangelo, is looking at you saying, I see an angel inside that chunk of marble. I see something beautiful inside of it. But God's going to have to do exactly what Michelangelo had to do to this chunk of stone. He said this, I created a vision of David like God has a vision of you. He said, I created a vision of David in my mind and simply carved away everything that was not David. Spiritual surgery means carving out all of those things that aren't of God. That God has a vision of your life. God has a vision of your future, and it's a prosperous, beautiful vision of blessings and favor, but he's going to have to chip away. We're going to have to go under the knife. And how do we know what needs to be chipped away? Peter gives us the answer. He says the answer is knowing that Jesus is your cornerstone. Now, just as I'm not an art guy, I'm not a building guy, I know we have some architects, engineers, people way smarter than me. I, I, I don't get that, but, but I love this image of a cornerstone. I'm told that way back when you would build any sort of building, be it a house or a structure or anything, the very first stone that you lay is this cornerstone. And the cornerstone is the first stone, it's the most important stone, it's the most beautiful stone, and it's laid right in a corner. And then everything else in that entire structure, all of the other building elements come out from that first stone. It sets the angles for every other part. It's got to be a perfect right angle, and then every other building material comes out of that cornerstone. And that's exactly what we are called to make Jesus. We're called to build our entire lives, to build our entire lives around who he is. And that's, that's a very different picture than many of us treat Jesus. We, we see the, the, the shirts aren't as popular now, but Jesus is my homeboy. We say Jesus is my friend. And, and all of that's true and good, but foundationally Jesus is our cornerstone. We, we don't sprinkle on a little bit here when we have tough times. We don't just say a blessing before a meal to make us feel religious, but he needs to be everything that we build our lives around. So the question is, what needs to come off? What, what are you treating as your cornerstone? Martin Luther, when he was talking about this passage, said the best way to, to understand whether or not Jesus is your cornerstone is to ask, what is your refuge? When things go wrong, where do you run? When things are not going where, your way, who, who do you run to? These things can be good, these things can be bad. Many of us, we say, when things are going bad, at least I've got a great family. We say, when everything's going bad, at least I've got a stable job. We say, when everything's going bad, at least I've got a, a 401k that's doing quite well, or at least I've got friends. All of those things are fine and good things, but when we treat them as our cornerstone, we're missing what God has in store. We're missing being that angel inside of the marble that Jesus is carving out of us. Maybe for you, it's the approval of others. In every personality test I've ever done, um, that, that's my number one um, need, is the approval of others. That, that may or may not surprise you. I'm not going to ask if it does. But, but that's a deep need inside of me. I, I want to be well-liked, right? Confession. I want to be liked. I think many of us want to be liked as well. But I want to be liked. And so it comes out in all sorts of ways. Alex made fun of me last night. Um, we had a guy a street over in our little subdivision uh, shooting off fireworks at like 1030, Okay. 9.30. It felt like 10.30. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so he's shooting off fireworks in our subdivision in College Station City Limits, okay? Keeping my dogs all angry, keeping my child awake. So you boys fired up, okay? I am angry, okay? So what do I do? I load up um, my, my, uh, my buddy, my best buddy, who's a, a football coach you can saw. He's got a little bit more um, <laughs> size to him. And, and, and we get in my truck, and we're going to go give these people a piece of my mind, right? So we roll on up, and I'm fired up. I just talked to another neighbor who drove by, too, and she said, I'm calling the cops on him. I said, great, good for you. I'm going to go tell him to stop. So we roll up, and the truck and I um, size up the uh, gentleman that we're um, going to be speaking to. Um, let's just say I, I would have been on the losing end of that battle. So I roll down the window, 
Uh, again, fired up. This guy's wrong. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. Hey, happy 4th of July. How's it going, sir? He said, fine. And I said, um, looks like y'all are having a great time. I, I don't know if you knew this or not. I know you just moved in the neighborhood. We're in city limits, and, and so you're not allowed to shoot off fireworks. I'm not sure if, I bet you didn't know that. But hey, I just talked to a lady, and she's calling the cops on you. So <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to warn you before the cops show up that someone else has called on you. You know, I, I'm the good guy here, right? I, I want to I wanna be liked. And so I have a tendency when things go wrong to at least think, well, at least someone likes me. I don't know who, but at least someone likes me. We all go to these places of refuge, and that can reveal what our cornerstone is. When what we see here is Peter says the surgery that you need to go under, the knife that you need to go under is seeing what your cornerstone is. And going under that knife, he says in verse 5, You yourselves are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood and to what? To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Going under the knife makes us into who all God has created us to be. But it requires sacrifice. I'm going to have to sacrifice maybe preaching some Lakeway sermons when I go under the knife. Or they might just be very interesting because of the medication I'm on, one way or the other. When we go under the knife, we have to sacrifice. And so the question tonight is, what do you need to sacrifice to prove, to reveal, and maybe to know that Jesus is your cornerstone? Maybe it's a sacrifice of time. Maybe it's setting down a phone or a screen for 30 minutes and saying, God, I've never prayed before, I've never studied your word, but I'm going to give it a shot. Maybe it's a sacrifice of a relationship. Someone you're spending time with that you know you maybe shouldn't be spending time with. Maybe it's a sacrifice of being too hard on yourself. Of allowing God to give you the vision that he has of you, that you are beautiful, you are precious, you are chosen. Maybe it's a sacrifice of finances. That you're finally ready to say, yes, God, I believe that you can do much more with my finances than I can. When we sacrifice anything, it's a sign of trust. It's a sign of saying, yes, God, you know better than I do. You have created all things, including me, as beautiful and as chosen and as precious. And I'm going to trust that you know better than I do. When we build our lives on that trust, when we fix our spiritual homes on that cornerstone, God is raising us up. It may take some hurt. It may take some heartache. It may take some surgery. But allow God to use that chisel and that scalpel to make us into the angels, into the beautiful stones, living stones that he's created us to be.